right, Kate, we're recording. I'm going to add you as co-host now. You know if that worked? Yep, that worked. Awesome. All right. We got a lot to cover, so let's get started. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm Larry Law. I'm the Executive Director of the Great Lakes Independent Booksellers Association. Uh, I'm in charge of education for Heartland and Heartland Summer. I am joined today by Carrie Obrey, the Executive Director of the Midwest Independent Booksellers Association, and Kate Scott, the Program Specialist for Midwest Independent Booksellers Association. Uh, just some housekeeping up top. Um, I think everyone has already, but please mute your mic if you um, are just joining um, as well. And I forgot to do this. If you could please add to your name, your bookstore or publisher to the end of your name. Uh, it just helps with questions. Uh, when we get into questions a little bit later in the chat. Um, I wanted to mention we are recording this session like all of our education uh, rep picks and author events. Uh, this particular session will be made available this Friday. Um, wanted to give you a weekly reminder of what we have coming up tomorrow, same time, 1 p.m. 1 p.m. Central, 2 p.m. Eastern. We have rep picks. Uh, tomorrow, we are featuring Hachette, Abraham Associates, Diamond Book Distributors, University of Minnesota Press, Sourcebooks, and Soho Press. And then Thursday nights, uh, please join us for an evening with Helen McDonald. Uh, her latest book is Vesper, Vesper Flights. Uh, you know her, you probably know her for H's for Hawk. And Robin Wall Kimmerer, author of Braiding Sweetgrass. Uh, that event will also be recorded. Um, throughout the session, if you do have a question, please throw it into chat. I'll be um, watching the chat for questions and asking when appropriate. Um, I want to thank all of our educators today. I want to thank Janet Webster-Jones, Allison Turner of Source Booksellers in Detroit, Michigan, Kathy Burnett, owner of Brain Layer Books in South Bend, Indiana, Angela Swishenettle, I knew I was going to mess that up, owner of Moon Palace Books in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and the moderator for today's event. Uh, Minneapolis-based writer and instructor, Anitra Vud. That being said, I'm going to kick it over to Anitra to get the conversation going. Thanks, Larry, and thanks to Miba and Gleba for having me. I'm, you know, really happy to be here. Although I will say, and I wanted to start off with full disclosure, when this project, when this uh, uh, moderating this panel was brought to me, the very first thought I had, the very first terrified thought that I had was, I don't want to be in a situation where I see a, a row of faces looking at me all saying, so Anitra, racism, how do we solve it? Let's talk. I'm like, I don't want that for me. I don't want that for anyone. I don't want that for any of our wonderful panelists here. I don't have all the answers. They don't have all the answers. So if you came here looking for the answer, capital A, just know that it's not coming. Uh, so I just wanted to be clear about that. Uh, so, <laughs> first, just starting off, I kind of just wanted to, to do a little bit of a check-in because I feel like, especially in the times we're living in now, sometimes the most complicated and fruitful question to ask somebody is, how are you? How are you doing uh, right now? And so I wanted to hear from sort of each one, sort of, how are you doing? How are you feeling right now in this week, in the last couple of weeks? And if there's anything that either I personally or one of your fellow booksellers can do to actually help you in a concrete way, let us know. Cause you know, mutual weight is a thing and I think we all need it. So let's start with Kathy. How are you? How am I? How are you doing? <laughs> are you I'm doing, doing fine. I'm doing great. I'm a little overwhelmed um, because of the way business has taken off during the unrest. But other than that, I'm finally finding my way to be online, I guess, and doing okay. Great. Good to hear. Uh, let's move over to Allison and Janet at Source. Hello. Huh? So we are um, a team of two, and so we're pretty busy um, just trying to, you know, answer um, whatever order comes our way. And so we're very grateful to our community for um, knowing that we're here and needing the information that they've been needing. Mm -hmm. Great. We're doing okay, though. Also, oh, yes, every day is okay. If you're breathing, 
and well. <laughs> it's good. Uh, well, I don't mean to feel like my own mother. I just like, like, are you all okay? Is everyone okay? Is everyone okay? All right. <laughs> Angela, what about you? How are you doing? I know you're very busy and you're in the warehouse. Um, we're still pretty overwhelmed. Uh, the, it's been a big adjustment, um, having most of the buildings in the neighborhood kind of gone and businesses, but also the pandemic, um, has made anything that we would have normally been able to do um, really challenging. Mm -hmm. Well, and that is actually kind of the first, you know, question I wanted to start with because obviously there has been change on several levels. So, you know, dealing with the pandemic represented one big sea change and then dealing with all the different protests and civil unrest, that's been another big sea change. And so I was wondering, and, and you can think of, you know, from wherever you want to start from, how have things changed in particular for your store, um, for your relationship with your community? And if you want to talk about how things have changed since the protests, how things have changed since the pandemic first hit, both of those things, either of those things would be fine. So how have things changed and what specific things have changed and how has your relationship changed with your community, if at all? Uh, let's start this time with uh, Janet and Allison. Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's wonderful to see faces. And that's probably the thing I miss most of all about uh, the pandemic is that when people now come to pick up books at the door, everybody looks like a bandit. We're all wearing our masks, and I can hardly recognize people. And one of our hallmarks, of course, um, for our store is that we were always in contact with people through their face and their voice, but not their name is so much. So we're having to learn to um, know, know voices and names a little bit better. I do want to say that our um, changes have been that, uh, that one in particular, but one of the big changes that has occurred is that we moved quickly on to online sales, which we had consciously not done in the past, we wanted to have a relational uh, business and not just a transactional one. Mm -hmm. And as a result, uh, da uh, my daughter, uh, I call her the brains and I'm the, but I'm the brawn. <laughs> of the and uh, she got quickly uh, onto the platform that was part of our, our, our POS system uh, and populated it and made it to fit us. And so we went quickly on to online sales and, uh, and online virtual events and the uh, sales have been quite robust. And it's been so surprising that because of all of the um, virtual everything that's going on, we've had calls and requests from people from all over the place, <laughs> around the country, in the metropolitan area and in other parts of the world as well. So I'm really grateful for that kind of change and it's really sort of changed the nature of our business, even though we still try to have a relational business. I think that's such an interesting point you say. I mean, because isn't it funny that in a time right now where I feel like we're sort of being called on to, to know each other a little bit better, to relate to each other a little bit more, maybe in ways some of us haven't, that we also have this sort of barrier, this new barrier to kind of being able to suss out people's feelings and thoughts and emotions and in tone. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's a very, that's a very interesting, very important comment, you know, and it seems, it seems like such a small practical thing, I think having the masks, but, but I think it really has changed the ways we communicate with each other. So, all right, let's move to Angela. Now, I know things have changed quite a bit <laughs> in your universe. So I would love to hear you talk a little bit about how have things changed? Yeah, we went to all online up until um, I guess the riot started and we took a break because we couldn't really work at that time. Um, and we're still online. We put up a, a walk-up window and for, we can do pickup, but our building's still boarded up, which feels pretty weird. And we're really planning on only doing online orders until I guess through the end of the year. We don't plan on reopening. But we've been so busy that we quit answering the phone um, and mm. we put an 
auto response on our email just because um, we couldn't really keep up with um, requests and we couldn't really answer the questions everybody had about um, the community and the neighborhood um, that we were getting uh, with the library closed. Uh, it was just much, which was really hard. Yeah, I mean, that was actually something I was, I was wondering about for all of you is sort of like how in, especially, you know, that's a very good point in the absence of like widespread opening of libraries, how much all of you have been sort of called on to be not just business owners, community members, but also sort of the font of information for your communities. I don't know how librarians do it. You know, like, like after the fourth time I explained to people how the internet works in general, not, you know, how to order from my website, but sure. how the internet works. I was just like, I, I, I can't do it. I think that, yeah, I think that is a very, I think that's a very big point is that I think bookstores are being called on to be even bigger and more expansive members of their community. It seems to me from the outside, yeah. but Kathy, what about you? How have things changed? Oh, unmute. Before we um, even had the president or anyone talking about COVID, back in January, um, I took a part-time job working for the Small Business Development Center, which I am a client there too. I'd already been thinking about moving my business to online. So we had been looking at what the sales were in the past from people, how did I communicate with people? Because I work with a lot of schools and a lot of the schools aren't even in my area. So I'd already been looking at that, but trying to figure out how to make a website more interactive, because I feel like, you know, because we deal so much with people in person that the website wasn't aside. It was just like something that's back there. And most times that people went to the website, they knew exactly what they were looking for. They would go for that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one thing that's changed. I'm getting a lot more questions about what should I be reading right now? What should I be discussing right now? Um, I also find that uh, things are a lot more personal because of the math, because of everything. So there's a lot more one-on-one -on -one because I'm not talking to a lot of, a big group of people. There's less chance that I'm interrupted when I'm talking to this person. Um, so I get to go a little bit deeper, I think, with people. Uh, that's been one thing and we're closed also like um, Angela and I think if I open in the fall it will be totally different it will just not be the same type of business I would still do appointments um, right now I do pick up on the weekends and I delivery on the weekends too because I have another job so I can't be there every day but the influx of orders both from in my community and outside um, had me scrambling to get more people on staff. So I, in one month, have hired five people. Mm -hmm. So it's been crazy, but good. I think that is a very common, crazy but good, is a message I'm hearing from lots of people <laughs> in lots of different areas, fortunately, unfortunately. Uh, now, so, I, Carrie very kindly mentioned in the notes the you know, where Moon Palace was kind of situated in events and in physical space made them a very, you know, they, they had a very central sort of part in the protest that happened here in Minneapolis. Angela and I are both in Minneapolis. Uh, so Angela, uh, I wanted to make a very specific narrow question about everything that happened over the last few weeks with the store. And the thing that I was wondering is, from the outside, it appeared to me that Moon Palace pivoted fairly quickly from, you know, retail establishment bookstore in the neighborhood to protester supporter safe spot for protesters. I know that you guys had um, allowed, you know, various like medical setups, I think, to happen to help protesters and that, you know, that there was and that you very emphatically pushed out the police from sort of setting up a staging area near the store, at least that's how I understand it. So I was kind of wondering, had there been any pre-discussion before any of this happened, like scenario planning or just a general statement of values? This is how we 
you know, this is how we show up in our community. This is what we believe about race and anti-racism. Had any of that discussion happened beforehand that allowed you to kind of make the switch so quickly as things were happening? Or was it genuinely like, here we go, we're in it, we're making changes? Oh, no, we've been working on this a long time. Okay. <laughs> um, um, my husband, Jamie, I think he did the math. He's been involved in uh, abolitionist stuff for 25 years now. Um, and I, I think we both didn't move next door to a police station without assuming at some point um, there was going to be an issue. Um, and we actually done a lot of um, talking with other businesses in the neighborhood um, and just among ourselves trying to figure out how to um, handle any issues we have without calling the police both ourselves as a store and then working with other businesses just to um, do our best to keep everybody safe. Mm -hmm. um, but during the protest, um, you know, we did get out there. Um, we were fairly ready, not our first riot. So. Um, I don't mean to laugh, but that was a very pithy comment. <laughs> Not our first rodeo. Uh, and actually, I wanted to throw that question out to the other panelists too. Um, and you can think of this as, you know, either responding to having to go online very quickly. Obviously, Kathy, you had already been thinking and planning and moving to make this shift. But um, I wondered, you know, had you engaged in any sort of, you know, scenario planning? I mean, how could you around? I don't know if you could around recent events. Well, my store is built as an inclusive bookstore. So we only sell books by black, um, LGBTQ, indigenous. We sell a very narrow set of books. So then we were already the space that people could come. We were already a safe space for we have a couple of universities for students to come if they felt like they weren't being supported on their campus based on, on their gender or sexuality or anything like that. So we had that. Um, already. So that was in place for us, even though we were closed, all the kids had my actual real phone number and real um, text as opposed to the stores, which go somewhere else. So they knew they could call me if they needed anything. Uh, my, my community is wonderful. They have always um, pretty much supported me while I'm here. I have a steady set of regulars who quickly also then went online and told people to shop at our place online. Um, and I'm lucky, I live in the same place as Mayor Pete and Chaston Duda Judge, and so they have all also used their Twitter to direct people to my site. And when I had to close my site, because we were getting too many orders, and moved to Bookshop, they also then sent people to um, Bookshop. Ah, wow, that's really wonderful. Actually, and that's a, that's a great answer to another question I had is sort of like, what has support from your community looked like? Like, and I know obviously everybody is, I think, kind of getting new, new customers and, and new people, you know, from all over the country who may not sort of represent your community as you saw it before. So I'm wondering, what does the community look like from your community? Um, source, Allison and Janet, how have, like, what is your core, how has your core community kind of responded or not responded to the bookstore situation? Well, we have a nonfiction niche. So that's a lot of history. There's a lot of um, history of movements, a lot of um, memoirs and all in what we sell and what we discuss and what we talk about. And so our, um, our community and customers are in Frontline Detroit, which is um, one of the group, groups that have um, wonderful, um, I guess, they, they are, they are, out in the out in the movement yeah. and so they come and um tell us you know what's going on give us statements um like the magazine riverwise and we push all those things out and we cheer them as they come by our store so um mm -hmm. if we weren't inside we'd be out there yeah so moving from that obviously the title of this session is you know about being an ally and i think you know that word has become so big 
and so multifaceted, uh, you know, over the last few months, over the last few weeks, especially. I don't know how Webster's is going to move forward in defining it <laughs> from now on. Uh, and so I really wanted to hear from each of you sort of how you view being an ally personally and as a business owner and as a business generally. So there's like, you know, there's different levels of allyship and how you engage. And so I know there's each of you as individuals. There's also each of you as business owners. And there's also each of you as part of a business collective. So thinking about all that, what does it mean to be an ally? I know, easy question, easy, done. <laughs> uh, let us start with, uh, let us start with Angela. Um, yeah, that's, it, it's really tough. And I think, uh, I try and remember that whatever I do or figure out, um, I leave room to make mistakes and it hasn't always been the same for me as a business owner from when we started to where um, we are now but one of the things I really try and do is um, always think about access to power um, and who's got that access um, and what can I do to sort of change who has that access um, I don't know if that's a useful way for other people to think about it or not, but. Um. Well, I, well I, I find it useful. Uh, um, and I appreciate from that comment that that lens is something that could work on the different levels of individual owner business collective, you know, just looking at things through that lens. So I appreciate how that can, that can apply to multiple levels of engagement, so. Kathy, same question to you. What does it mean to be an ally on those different levels? Well, for me, um, one of the first things I did was I started a fundraiser for um, students that go to Title I schools who may not have things at home since they were being sent home um, back in March and school was closing. And what would they do at home, especially if some of their parents were essential workers? So I started a donation so that we could get them activity books, yoga cards, like different things that they could pull out and do sticker books um, while they were at home. So that was one, like cooperating closer with the schools in my area and also with other businesses. What can we do as a collective um, to help people who need access right now, who need access to food, who need access to technology? Um, I wrote a proposal to our mayor of working on a, like a, area-wide book program where people could read and we would have videos and do that. So we're working on that right now. Uh, so that's kind of, and that's also for the store, but me getting out and talking more and being more aggressive about pulling these partnerships in and defining, help defining together what that actually looks like. Because mm -hmm. more collaboration than competition is kind of what we were trying to do. Oh, I'll put that on the poster. <laughs> Thank you for that answer. and. Well, I want to go, I want to get source. I want to get your input on this first before I speak. So the same question, what does it mean to you to be an ally to both of you, um, individually, business owners, as a business in general, what do you think it means to be an ally? Well, frankly, I never thought about being an ally. Mm -hmm. I really think about the store as well embedded into the community and mm -hmm. the community uh, participants are all the people who ever come to the store, who reach out to us, who we reach to. And uh, I think that our, our practice has been that we are an open book, open store, open mind, and that we are in touch with uh, people of all varieties and uh, ideas about life. Uh, we have had so many calls from people that are far away from us and yet uh, we're connected because they had an interest in us and we have an interest in them. So I never thought about the word ally. It seems like a us and them kind of a mm. uh, scenario. So I'd rather say that we are part of the community. We are, we, we are in the community and we are people who live right in this place. And whatever we do, uh, we hope will touch others and what others do will touch us. Uh, I think Allison mentioned the protesters went down the street and we like to go out and wave our hands and, and say hallelujah to them, too. Uh, 
And so, and our connection, I think, to other uh, organizations in the city, uh, both grassroots and corporate, uh, we have that practice that we've been doing all along. So if that's what it means to be an ally, I guess that's what we are. <laughs> You know, it really, what I was thinking as you were all talking is that it really strikes me how much each of the stores is operating from some of its biggest strengths and it's sort of its niches, you know, like obviously with Source, you have this deep nonfiction and informative and historical, you know, trove of knowledge to offer and, you know, to be available as that resource. And then, you know, Kathy working with kids and knowing kids and working with schools that you're able to step into that in this sort of new reality. And same thing with Angela, like being aware from the beginning of your sort of not just, you know, not just position metaphorically in the community, but also position physically in the community and sort of like what that means for how you operate. Um, you know, I, I think that's to me, um, I, I personally, you know, gotten a lot of, you know, sort of like, what do we do, Anitra? What do we do? Like those kinds of things. And, you know, I think that it's very, um, it's very inspiring that you're all sort of like, what do you do is you just keep doing what you're doing really well and you keep doing it and you do it outward into the community. And you're sort of bringing, each of you are bringing your strengths outward into your communities in different ways and sort of operating from that core that was already there. So I'm very impressed with that. Uh, so I like to ask this question of anybody I ever talk to ever, but what has been the single most surprising thing to you about recent events? Some things I, I can just say personally from the get go that some things about recent times have really surprised me and some things have not surprised me at all, not even a little bit. <laughs> Um, so I'd love to hear from you. What has been sort of the most surprising, surprising element of the last like three, four weeks for you? Uh, let's start here with uh, Janet and Allison. Okay, so uh, I wouldn't say so much surprising. It's been very rewarding and we've been mm. feeling a lot of gratitude for the, the, yes. the robust uh, sales that we've had through our, um, through this time. I think what's been surprising to me is that the the business has shifted to another uh, variety of the same business. Mm -hmm. And it's not surprising because we've had uh, 30 plus years of, of um, work in this uh, wonderful uh, industry. And we've been nimble enough to move and change. And that, that was a recognition on my part that we do have that capacity and have used that capacity as we've gone along. So, um, so uh, we, um, a lot of this is not surprising. I think mm -hmm. what's really interesting about it all is that this uh, pandemic is novel. This virus is novel. But it's not that we have never had times before when we had to shift and change and grow and go with what's happening in the community. So I don't know how surprising it is. It is a recognition that over time and over one's lifetime, we're gonna have a lot of reasons to change and shift and move with the forces that, that are impacted. I wish I could bottle your equanimity and just carry it with me wherever I go. <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's really key to keep knowing who you are and who you are as a business person and what you are offering to the community and if, how can you do it? Like when things shuttered quickly for us, we had a really great weekend. We had money in the bank and by Monday it was all gone. So our nimbleness allowed us to reach toward online sales, to reach for grants, uh, to go to our particular places where we needed to get help. And once we got, uh, got on that track, we worked with that for a while and then as we had more and more sales, we were able to now, uh, we can stand on our own legs, but at that time, uh, we had to get some support under us, and that support was out there really for us as we reached for it. Actually, I wanna pick up on a, on, on a, a point you just made there about really knowing who you are is sort of like allowing you to be nimble and to respond to events very nimbly. And I was just curious of all of you here, if. Um, 
if sort of like, I mean, I come from kind of nonprofit land. And so we talk a lot about mission statements and vision statements and all of that. And I kind of wondered if any of you sort of do that work regularly. Are you having discussions or thinking about, you know, this is the mission, this is the vision. Is that something that happens on a regular basis? Is that something that you do with your staff? Because it occurs to me that knowing who you are and what your values are is part of the foundational work of figuring out how are you going to be an ally at all or what are you going to do in your community? Like, I feel like it has to kind of start from knowing your values and knowing what you're about. So what, what kinds of ongoing work do you each do in that area? Or is it just, it's part of my DNA, I don't have to talk about it. <laughs> uh, Kathy. Um, for me, since I am fairly new and people are getting to know the store since I was, I think I was just past two years. Um, it is sticking to my mission and what I buy for the store, what I sell for the store, what I post about the store, what it looks like on Facebook, on Twitter, uh, on Instagram. I think having that be, they, people knowing that this is my mission and this is what we stand for and this is what we're trying to do. I get less questions about, are you going to carry this book or that book or this book? Um, I talk about that every store is curated. So every store is censored and that you buy what you feel your community uh, needs. And you, for me, my community needs to read about more people. They need to have a more global outlook. I'm in the middle of Indiana. Um, people don't wear masks around us. They believe it's a hoax or it's a political thing. Um, and I want to, I want to counter that. And so they know that my store is a place to counter that. So when they come in the store, they know what to expect, what's on the walls, what's on the shelves, and what we're going to talk about while we're there. So having your mission just kind of informs the people and yourself of this is what I stand for and this is what I believe in. Mm -hmm. Angela, I'm interested in hearing on this from you too about, because I know that there's, I don't know the exact staff size at Moon Palace, but obviously there, there's a staff. And so I wonder especially about, you know, there's having the vision as a business owner, and then there's also communicating the vision, not just to your customers, but also to the people you work with. And so I'm kind of wondering what's your take on it from that level? Sure, I, I have to say, I, I'm really bad at mission statements. <laughs> you know, like, this is, is, you know, my goal for, you know, 2021 is gonna be working on that part. I definitely know where my line is, and, you know what I don't want to cross and um, for the store during the protest I knew that I didn't want anyone to get hurt defending the store you know like I justice is more important to me than the building that we're in but as far as um, a mission uh, on day-to-day -day stuff I'm very specific that we're a general interest neighborhood bookstore. And if we look like we're leftist or that we're community run or that um, we're mission driven, it's because my neighborhood and my community is that way. And our store reflects that. Um, and that seemed like for me the easiest way to say what we're about is our community um, and stay true to ourselves. There you go, mission statement, you're done. Yeah, okay. Well, you don't have to wait till 2021. 2021, I'm so ready. <laughs> uh, now, I know that, you know, and I know I said at the beginning, you know, we're not here to give easy answers or anything like that. But is there sort of one thing that you sort of like one thought or one idea that you wish you could plant in the heads of your customers, your fellow bookstore owners who might not be where you are? Um, just one thing that you're like, if I, I hope that if one thing can be learned from this situation, it is this. I like to call this the magic wand, the magic wand of if I could miraculously make my children clean their rooms without asking, if I could miraculously 
make people kinder on the bus. <laughs> so um, just what is one thing that you'd, you'd hope that doesn't get lost from these times or, or something that people can take away from these times moving forward? Uh, let's start with Angela. Um, oh man, one thing. I've <laughs> just one. <laughs> I just, I try and tell people all the time how proud I am of my community and the protests and um, for as hard as it is for a lot of people, um, it was a really beautiful experience for me to look out and see so many of my customers changing the world. And for me to be able to say, I know what kind of poetry they read. <laughs> I, I felt so proud. <laughs> and I just want, I'd love for people to have that, you know, that warm feeling for each other that I've got for them, for the neighborhood. That would be a nice thing to carry forward, I think. Janet and Allison, same question to you. What's one, if you could wave a wand and everybody learns one thing, everybody takes one thing from events going forward, you can make that happen, what would it be? Well, I'm the old person and we have a younger person here. So I'll say from the older person's perspective. First of all, I think you have to understand that we are in uh, a moment in time but it's also a movement in time as well. And that this time will pass and there'll be something more. And here again, you have to stick with who you are and what you believe. And for those people who maybe have not really had to address uh, the issues of race and economic um, gaps, uh, housing, housing problems, education, the pandemic has brought all of that out and it's making us have to think differently and new in a new way about all of these things, money, education, I, I call them the universals, mm -hmm. uh, housing, uh, uh, income, child uh, care, child care, education, um, uh, transportation, all of those things have been brought to the foreground. And so it's our opportunity to share with others uh, what we can find in the books that we uh, sell. And it's also an opportunity to model our own behavior not be scared. We're not going to be around being scared, not, be, <laughs> not being worried that a bug might get us, like I just saw a little bug, a little fruit fly just fly by. Uh, and to be uh, empathetic to uh, people who may not think really the same way. And that's really tough. Uh, empathy is a heart problem. And we have to work on the uh, empathetic possibilities that some of what we're talking about now may not always be absolutely true in the future. Uh, and some things that we are talking about will be necessary for the future. Minneapolis is such a good example of uh, looking at the whole policing issue. And it's not for the first time that this has been looked at, but now it's the right time. So I think we have to be solid and true to ourselves and to our business and uh, understand that we are a part of the community. We're not the only part. Go ahead, Ellen. Oh no, freedom's a constant struggle. <laughs> Did you want to answer, Allison, of if you had one thing that you would hope that people take away from this? Uh -huh. The book title. She, she said <laughs> was book could be for, and then this could be for any one of the many stakeholders that are part of your bookstore community. You know, for if you're like customers, if you could just know one thing, or bookstore owners in a different state, if you could just know one thing, whatever. Well, as far as we know, um, freedom is a constant struggle that, that you constantly need new information and you need to, um, you know, freedom is the ability to make plans for yourself. And so that's something that we do every day and everything that we um, read or learn should be towards that goal. Hmm. And Kathy, I know you're coming from an education background, so like you might have the idea to actually put a thought in somebody's in a lot of somebody's heads more than maybe me is there no. one thing that you'd want um, people to learn i think they both really said it already it's basically that we're in this together um and if one of us succeeds all of us succeed and each time there's a problem instead of going in your corner and trying to figure out the answer 
get with your people, get with your community, because everybody's going to bring something different to the table, and then it makes the table better. We have more to um, to work with, to use. So I think that's it. Is like Jim said, one, you must know who you are. You have to know who you are. You have to know what you stand for. You have to know what you're going to fall for and all of that. Like, where, where are you in this community? And then where are you plugged in that? Because it can't just be one way. It can't be all what my community is doing for me. What am I doing to uplift my community um, too? And the more you think about that and make sure that you are doing this, even when it's difficult, like right now it's a lot easier because everybody's at home. Everybody's in one space mm -hmm. and you have almost a captive audience. Um, but you don't always have that. So how will you then continue lifting up people even after this? Mm, the long term, the long vision. And I think that really speaks to what Janet was saying about thinking of this not as, you know, a discrete moment in time, but something that's part of a much larger continuum, much larger movement. So, okay, taking up, okay, I see it's 141. I am Larry and Kate and Carrie and everybody, I will leave time for questions that it's totally gonna happen, but at least one more question. So this is sort of the devil's advocate question. You know, for any bookstore owner who may be here, who might be just out in the world, who's sort of like, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know how to get involved, I don't feel qualified to speak to issues of race and anti-racism, I, feel uncomfortable, I'm not sure where I fit in, what if, will I lose business, if, you know, customers think I'm taking a very strong political stance. Um, so what might you say to, you know, any bookstore owner that's sort of feeling a little at sea in all this? Uh, let's start with Kathy. Well, um, it still goes back to knowing what you stand for why did you open your bookstore what are you trying to do with your bookstore how are you trying to contribute and that tells you what you need to do if you're in it to help a certain type of people are you reading about that are you talking to them um, one thing we forget is to talk to the people we're trying to serve what exactly mm -hmm. do they need instead of just giving them what we want what do they need from us um, and so i think if you don't feel qualified to talk about race you just need to educate yourself you're a bookseller anyway right the only way you sell books as an independent bookstore is you read the books or you know somebody's read the books. You have to have a, a knowledge of the books. Uh, we talk about this a lot when people say, I can't sell diverse books or inclusive books. My people don't want that. You can sell anything how you sell anything else. I think <laughs> you know it. When you know the attributes and the benefits, that's how you sell it. So educating yourself, making sure you're reading the books. Um, if you need to, reach out to another bookseller and ask them what are the top 10 books you think I should be reading or what's one book I could start with. But it's like you said, it's never ending. Like Dennis said, it's never ending. But we know the top 10 books that are being bought right now. Have you read any? Do you want to discuss any? I mean, there's people in your community that might feel the same way that you do. Like how do you help then a book club in your community because you're in the same spot? How do you come together with them and you guys learn together? Um, just education, education, education. Education and collaboration. Yes, yes, yes. Well, I was going to say my tagline is um, developing empathy and building community through the discussion of inclusive books. So that's kind of what I think everything is. We build, we learn about each other. That gives us empathy towards each other. And together we build this community. I mean, but it has to be a discussion and open. Angela, same question. Uh, how, how would you, what might advice would you maybe give to a bookstore owner that was sort of feeling like, I don't know what to do. I'm not sure what my place here is. I'm not, you know, I don't have any experience thinking through these kinds of issues. What might, what advice might you give them? Well, I was thinking, you know, if I can do it, you can do it. <laughs> um, but also, you know, before this, the protests and the pandemic, I mean, most days I didn't feel qualified to run a bookstore. I did it anyway. <laughs> so, you know, I don't know what's coming next, but I'm not going to let it stop me. <laughs> Learn new things every day. They can too. I think that's, I think that also really speaks to Allison's point again about, you know, that this, like, it's a struggle. It's a struggle. And that means that you won't always know what to do and that you won't always feel qualified yeah. to act or to speak or to make a statement, but that there's a certain level of just bravery 
in owning a business that also has to translate to the bravery to be part of your community, I think. Yeah. Not to put words in your mouth. You got to say your mouth. <laughs> and then uh, finally, Janet and Allison, uh, what would your advice be to sort of those, those booksellers, book, bookstore owners, rather, who are kind of struggling with what to do, how to respond, you know, how to move forward, what their place is? So if someone comes and it comes in the bookstore and wants a particular um, book or has a particular interest, I think we should all um, hand sell them um, books that we know. So we should read a little bit about them and make sure that we're, um, we're offering them something that they want um, and that can deepen their understanding and what they're interested in. The same way you would do if, if you have a, uh, um, a lot of romance novels and someone has a particular taste in romance and you're like, oh, this one would be great for you. And so I just, I think just to have the same um, joy in book selling for all topics, really, including um, sensitive ones. Um, I know with um, Angela in Moon Palace, um, I was, we weren't so familiar with um, Anastasia Higginbotham, and now we just hand sell it like crazy. So. <laughs> I think that's such, a, that's such a great point about joy, too. I, I, I did an interview recently with somebody who was um, asking me about you know, diversity and sort of copywriting and editing and publishing, and I said that one of my thoughts I'd been having a lot recently was just, I wish that people wouldn't treat sort of learning about, you know, diverse voices, learning about Black people and businesses as this sort of sad burden that they're taking on. Like, oh my God. Oh, I had no idea. I'd better go and be supportive now. I'm like, hey, you could be excited. You could be joyful about all the great books you're going to read and businesses you're going to support and, you know, people well, you meet. Like, I feel pretty awesome. I think I would think somebody was kind of lucky to get to know me as an editor, you know? And, and so it's a little bit like, I'm like, please try not to be so sad. <laughs> like, there's, like, there's joy in learning new things, or at least it, there should be. <laughs> I mean, I just add to that. Um... I think that it's on us as adults, as business people, as booksellers, to be curious about what's going on in our own backyard, our own neighborhood, our own place. I listen to the radio a lot, and then I want to listen to what other people are talking about. Just the other day, a man called up from somewhere way out somewhere, and he said, I heard about your bookstore, and I want to tell you, I haven't read a nonfiction book in a long time. She said, and I want to ask you this question. Are you a Black-owned bookstore? I said, yes, and women and old, too, so that we have a variety of a diversity in our bookstore. So I think we have to have our, and so I, he said he liked mysteries and stuff. Well, we don't do much of that, but I got busy and pulled out a bunch of, of, of authors for him, along with the three uh, I call them the big five of this time period, books that he wanted, he knew about, how to be an anti-racist and, mm -hmm. and white supremacy, and he, he wanted those. And so I pulled out a list of people that I'm in touch with, I'm familiar with, that do crime, uh, true crime, mystery, uh, that would satisfy him. So knowing uh, what you can do, I think that's why people who are have been in education or library work or any kind of literary work make great booksellers because we have a curiosity for literature and for for learning as well and to share that with other people so i think in conclusion before we get into the q a's what i have really heard from this conversation has been curiosity empathy learning willingness to make mistakes and be uncomfortable and above all knowing yourself on a very foundational level is you know, what's going to help you sort of operate most effectively and most joyfully in this world that we live in as bookstore owners and booksellers and readers and just as people, human beings. That's what I'm taking away. <laughs> uh, okay, so I have not been, I've seen the, the chats and comments popping up from people. Thank you so much, everybody, for chiming in as we've gone through. Uh, Larry, Carrie, Kate, are there any questions from the audience? 
there haven't come any any questions come through chat uh, so i'd encourage anybody that does have a question just to unmute yourself and ask it um, i'll give a second for anyone to respond i do have a question i'd like to ask uh, if we don't have uh, anybody that wants to jump in first no all right i'll kick it off okay uh, so we're in such a bizarre time you know we're straight out of a still in a pandemic into civil unrest and we're all still kind of in this little bubble coping with with the situation the best we can have you thought you know one day we'll have a vaccine will things will be some kind of normal again have you thought about uh what that looks like for your store coming out of this what kind of conversations you'll have in person what kind of events you'd like to put on um how will you handle handle in-person conversations when your stores are back open? And and I guess leading into the uh, election in November, do you have any events or pl are planning anything leading into that? Oh, that old thing. That. <laughs> <laughs> That's ages away, Larry. <laughs> uh, uh, let's see. Uh, source booksellers, could you start us off? Uh, what are you think? Are you thinking toward when you know things are changed? Uh, when you know when if we have a, a vaccine and things are different in that way, have you thought about what that time might look like and what you might want to do? Well, all those things are maybe suppose and what if. I think that the store will tell you what to do, and the customers will tell you what to do. We had a little trial with having one, two, or three customers in for browsing, and it made me crazy. So I said, oh, we're not going to do that for, <laughs> for a while, because uh, the store has given us online sales, people calling on the phone to order books, people writing us emails to order books, looking at the Instagram to order books. And so all of that's going on at the same time people are coming in. Now we've modified that a little bit. Uh, when people come to pick up now at the door and if they step in, if, if they need to step in and they can, uh, we invite them to browse like, like that. So we'll see what the, what the store tells us to do and we'll see what the community is up for. I don't know about vaccines. I know they take a long time to be, have integrity. And so I think that we just have to wait and, and see where we are with all that and then serve the public and serve the needs of the people as that comes along. I just typed that down in my notes. The store will tell you what to do because I assume that's going to be the title of whatever business advice book you end up writing that comes out of this. So there is your title. The store will tell you what to do. Boom, it's done. We're going to start pre-orders right now. <laughs> Uh, Kathy, uh, same question to you. Have you looked forward to the future? Have you thought anything about how things might change, especially in terms of events or in-person conversations, anything like that? Well, the beauty that I find right now in terms of events is that we could reach more people. Yes. Um, we also, as a smaller, newer bookstore, I get to talk to more publishers who are willing to let me have an online event where they were not so willing to have an author come to my store. Um, so I will be doing a lot more of that. I had already been working on a couple of workshops. So doing book clubs that are more of an experience where we're discussing things beforehand before we come together. Um, and then we have like a little homework. So it's kind of a series of book, of book clubs. So we're doing, I'd already been working on a lot of that stuff. So I'm excited that I will have an audience to start putting this in place. Um, my new website's being built and almost done. I wanted a book, a website that was less about just coming and buying a book, more about coming to be educated uh, about whatever it is you were having a question with. So I've been working a lot with, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, there's a website that talks a lot about marketing. I've been doing a lot of marketing, like how, oh, yeah. what is the question that people come looking for for me? It's what do I, what do I read for this? What do I read for that? And how do I answer that question on the website that I'm building? And how do I answer that question with the events that I'm planning? Um, so we have, uh, we're doing Raina and Robin with Comic Con this weekend, so we get to be a part of that. And then I am doing an event with Kwame, and I have a book, uh, an event with Jason Reynolds coming up. Um, I am being very particular about who I say yes to and who I go after to make sure that it supports the mission um, that I'm doing. Before I was just like, oh, let me do an event with everybody so I can get people to come to the store, but. Mm -hmm. If I'm going to be true to my mission, I'm going to make sure that that reflects in the events that I have too. 
Mm, great points there. Although I, I must say, I'm like, you teachers always trying to sneak in homework. Like always sneaking in that homework. It always gets in there somehow. <laughs> Uh, and finally, Angela, to you, have you thought much about how things will look a few months, a year down the line? And if so, have you thought about how you might respond in terms of events, customer relations, any of that? Like, have you thought that far ahead? I mean, I know you're sitting in a, bo in a pile of boxes of books, so maybe you're more thinking about the next hour. <laughs> you know like after the vacation that i dream of i think uh, my fantasy is just being able to uh, talk to people all day and you know really interact with customers in a way that we just haven't been and that i think we all really miss even those those booksellers who are like i'm not really a people person uh, but as far as the next couple of months um Things are calm here now, but it's not over, you know. Um, I think we're really working to keep it all together, get everything under control, and hold the space. Um, the neighborhood is really changing, and um, we're looking at at least five years of construction. Um, mm -hmm which is hard to imagine what that's really going to feel like um, post-pandemic. Um, yeah. Election. Thank you. Oh, sorry. The election. Ah. <laughs> I think that's the meme right there. The election. <laughs> well, I know we're basically out of time, I think. Uh, just about? Yeah, we, we do have a couple minutes left. Um, there were a couple questions that came through. Oh, great. Uh, if we want to get to them quickly. Yeah. Um, uh, Alana Haley, uh, are you feeling ultimately hopeful about book selling now and in the near future? Ooh. Hmm. What do you think, Kathy? Well, books have always been the answer to everything for me. I always will recommend the book whenever people say whatever. I can think of a book that goes with that whatever. So yes, I think I am optimistic that book selling is going to be stronger, um, especially the people who were able to pivot um, when they had to close their stores and go online or when there was a protest happening outside their window. Uh, if you were able to survive and actually kind of thrive during this time, I think you, it, it, it bodes well. And we are becoming uh, more specific, looking at different books, what you're putting out there. I think that also bodes well, especially if we can cash in, not cash in like money, but cash in on people who are reading this book. I know that 600 people bought this book from me. What yeah. am I doing to support those 600 people? What could I send them as an email, as a follow-up to now you have this book and you read it, now what? What does that look like? How do you translate that? Um, so I think if we could move on those kind of things, yeah, I think that's how we'll survive. I think that's what booksellers need to bring to the table is not just here's this book for you, but let's talk about some ideas of what we do with this book in our community after we've read it. Right. Janet and Allison, same question. Okay, so I, I think the other speakers are absolutely uh, correct with all this that um, I want less to be a propagandist and more of a bookseller. So I mm -hmm. want to look and be sure that I'm hearing what uh, the customer is asking about, looking for. And if I need to pounce and really get them going on something else, special and new, I do that too. But I think the process of interaction with customers and uh, exchange between customers, we loved having people come in and talk to each other, which is not going on very much now just because of a limited time, uh, space and the social distancing requirements. But I think that we have to first listen, second ask, third offer, and then sell. Mm -hmm. Just like that. And those all sound like, you know, those are all actions that are positive actions moving forward and steps to take. And I feel like, you know, that really speaks to the level of optimism, you know, that it, it seems like you personally feel about book selling think, in the state of the industry. I think it's very important to think action. Uh, mm -hmm. We can 
we bookie people tend to be thinkers, 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 and oh, over who there and if, if, when, and all that. We've got to take action on behalf of our books, on behalf of our community, on behalf of people that, that come to us and that those that we reach to. We also reach to other uh, uh, groups of people and invite them to participate in maybe the virtual uh, uh, author talks uh, or a book deal of some kind. So I think action is a big part of book selling. So here we go, action. <laughs> action. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay. It's 2.01 on my time. Can I let Angela answer about yeah, hopeful? Absolutely. Yeah, okay, absolutely. Good. Well, we That'll can be the last thing. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Angela, how do you feel? You feel are you feeling hopeful about the state of book selling, the industry at large moving forward? Yeah, I think the pandemic actually brought on a lot of really important conversations that we hadn't been having about money and more conversations about money and um, how are we all going to make a living at this because it's hard. You know. Uh, it was one of those things that we weren't talking about the way that um, I would have liked, you know, pre-pandemic, but our, those conversations are happening in publishing, book selling, and um, I like to think that we're going to come out of it um, changed. Great. And on that note, I would just like to say thank you, thank you, thank you again um, for staying here for chatting, for being available. I know, especially right now, during such a busy, busy, busy time for all of you that it's really hard to carve out an hour in the day to have these kinds of conversations, but you did it. And I appreciate that so much, you know, as a individual and as a reader. Uh, and then I just want to make a little tiny plug. Um, yes not only just for supporting, you know, supporting these bookstores, supporting these amazing booksellers and bookstore owners, but also if you're on this call and you only sort of chime in or sort of reach out to your fellow Meba and Gleba members, um, you know, in the context of these kinds of calls, don't do that. Like, if there's something you want to talk about, if there's something you want to know, if there's something you need help with, all of these people are, are in the world outside of this Zoom call. So, you know, I just, I've been thinking more and more with all of my clients, like, don't forget to rely on the people and the networks that you're already a part of. Like, this doesn't just need to be a one, one time, one and done conversation between you and your fellow bookstore owners. They're out there and they're ready to talk. So, all right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anitra. This was absolutely wonderful. Thank you, Janet. Oh. Thank you, Allison. Thank you, Anitra. Thank you, Angela. Thank you, Kathy. Um, I do want to say uh, this has been recorded, uh, will be available this Friday. So please feel free to view it again, share it with anybody you think would benefit from it. Um, but this was really fantastic. So thank you. Yay. Thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful rest of the day and please stay safe. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you.